Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Buying and Renovating 101 with the Preservation Resource Center of New Orleans. My name is Danielle Del Sol. I'm the Executive Director, and I'm so grateful that you all have tuned in tonight for the special class. Um, we have two very seasoned renovators with us um, and investors, and we're really excited um, to have both of their expertise with us tonight. Um, Charlie Erstat and Randall Duplessis, both of whom we're also very lucky to have on the PRC board. So um, I'll introduce them a little more formally in just a moment. Um, but first, I will I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the Preservation Resource Center. We are a 46-year-old nonprofit that has been dedicated to the preservation and restoration of New Orleans historic neighborhoods and architecture and cultural identity for decades. We're very grateful to all of our members who are joining us tonight and all of our donors. You make our work possible. Um, classes like this, we, we put them on because we know that um, the more of you who know how to renovate historic properties, the more of our special city's architecture will be saved and live on into the future. So we offer this class free tonight so that you all can be inspired, you can do this good work, and we're so grateful to our experts to offer this information to you all. So thanks to all of you who are members of the PRC and donors and make our work possible. If you want to know how to become a member or a donor to the PRC, I'd love for you to do so. Visit our website, prcno.org. You can become a member, you can make a donation. Um, uh, visit us today and sign up. Follow us on social media through Facebook and Instagram as well. I want to thank some of our wonderful donors who have actually just in the past few weeks either renewed or become new donors to the Preservation Resource Center at the President Circle, which is a very high level donor and, and so it's really important to us for that for us to have that funding um, to continue our work throughout the year. So very quickly, I'd like to thank Sunny and Laura Shields, Randy and Kathy Apatowski, Jason Wagusback and Jeff Morgan, John Reed and John Kemp, Nadja and Adolph Bynum, Catherine and Tony Gelderman, Holly and Jeff Snodgrass, Stephen and Nancy Hales, Julie McCollum, and Dorothy Nelson. And then I'd also like to thank the following um, organizations for their incredible generosity um, to the PRC this year. Continental Underwriters and the Elder Brown Family, the Roth Law Firm, the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation, and the ASB Fund. I'd also like to thank two new donors um, who recently came, came on to support our education and general programming, and that's Christina Tang and Yolita Rausch. Thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate you. So on to tonight's great class. Um, like I said before, we have two really experienced um, renovators, investors here with us tonight to present this course for you all. The first is Char Charles or Charlie Erstadt. Charlie was born in Manhattan and he resided there until moving to Miami in 2002. And he lived in Miami for 15 years. Um, he was also president um, for a time of the Miami Design Preservation League, which is a fabulous preservation organization based in South Beach. Um, he moved to New Orleans in 2015. He has held his real estate agent's license since he was in college, so that was over 40 years ago. And he has extensive experience on all types of projects, from renovating a condo to buying shopping centers and everything in between. Even with his vast renovating and restoration experience, he says his proudest accomplishment was renovating his house in the Garden District. And he claims it went smoother than any project I've ever, ever done and it looks fantastic. Well, thank you, Charlie, so much for being here tonight. I'd like to also um, introduce Randall Duplessis. Randall Duplessis is a born and raised native New Orleanian who studied architecture at Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He worked as an intern architect for five years and then started his own construction company, Cohesive LLC in 2013, which focuses on residential design build pro projects. He has worked restoration and renovation projects all over the city of New Orleans from up down to Treme, with his most visible renovation currently happening right now on iconic Esplanade Avenue. So thank you gentlemen so much for being with us tonight. Um, we're gonna start with Charlie. Charlie's gonna kick things off for us. So Charlie, take it away. Well, thanks Danielle and uh, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, this is really exciting and uh, first time I've done it. So if I do something dumb, you'll I'm sure let me know. Um, but, uh, you know, I could talk for hours about real estate and um, uh, I don't have hours to do that. So I'm going to skim over some of this, but 
Um, you know, we can try and get into more details with questions at the end. Uh, just to let you know, um, you know, this is not a financial planning course, nor is, is this a legal uh, advice situation. Um, so, you know, write that off. Don't, you're not going to, you know, you get what you pay for, I guess. Um, uh, but also know that I'm not a broker or I'm not working as a broker these days here in New Orleans. So um, I've got nothing to sell myself, which is sort of comforting, I suppose. Um, so let's, uh, let's start with the first slide, Danielle. And uh, this is basically, you know, sort of um, before you jump into this, uh, you should really think seriously about your financial situation. You can go on to the next slide. Um, be prepared financially. Uh, buying a home is a major financial commitment. And I do not want you to get involved with anything like this until you're absolutely sure that you can afford it. Um, and so, you know, you're going to have to go to a bank. So you're going to have to get your financial situation in order, get your financial health in order, both for them, but also for you. I mean, you know, this is, as I say, something major that may be one of the most in, uh, important investments you'll ever make. And you better be darn sure that you know what you're doing and that you're ready for it. Um, that means eliminating any outstanding debt that you might have out there, uh, checking your, your FICO score, um, and uh, just, you know, please think this carefully through. Um, the next slide, please. One of the most important things you can do it to, to make sure you know what you're doing um, is making a budget. Uh, go through all your household and, and living expenses. Uh, write them down. I know it's a pain. I'm horrible at it. Nobody likes to do it but it's a really, really important exercise. Um, and then consider all the new expenses that you'll be responsible for when you have this new property on your hands. Um, so there's a bunch of things that people forget about. There they are on the slide, taxes, insurance, utilities, um, and then the maintenance of the property. It all adds up, so keep that in mind. Um, next slide. Uh, the other thing you're gonna have to do is to come up with uh, sort of a list of all your, or, or, or make sure you have that pot of money in, in place, cash reserves. Um, you're gonna probably have to have between 20 or 25%, maybe a little bit lower if you can swing it uh, with the right lender, um, but you'll need 20 or so percent as a down payment for this property. That's a lot of money. Um, you're also gonna need to think about what it's gonna cost to renovate if you plan to do that. So we'll talk a little bit more about having, how to budget on that um, a bit uh, later, but, but that's another pot of money you're going to have to set aside. And then um, finally, I am a big proponent of this, and a lot of people forget to do it or don't think about it, but please have a cash reserve on hand for day-to-day -day living expenses. Um, a lot of experts talk about three or six months of living expenses. We all know around here that there can be some really you know, serious catastrophes that can happen, um, and certainly the, the new world we live in with COVID um, and loss of jobs and things like that make, make it even more uh, important to plan for the worst case scenario. Um, next slide, please. Um, the most important thing also to keep in mind, or an important thing, is that real estate's not a, a liquid investment. That is that you're not gonna be able to sell it or you may not be able to sell it as quickly as you buy it. Um, markets change rapidly. And uh, you know what may be a hot market right now or an easy market to get into may turn out to be a really slow and a very frustrating time to, to sell your property. Um, so don't, you know, don't just think that, well, things don't work out, I'll sell. That may not be so easy. And I believe me, I've been there and it's not a pleasant situation. So keep that in mind. The next slide, please. Um, you're gonna get a million documents before, you, before during, and after you buy this, this property. Um, there are a lot of stuff to read there, a lot of fine print please read everything. I mean, it sounds elementary, but I've got to tell you, you know, a lot of people forget to do that and find themselves in hot water. So just don't assume anything. If there's any questions about that dense type that you're looking at, you don't know what it is, just ask questions. And please don't sign documents that, are, that have blanks left in them in some way. That's a good way to get yourself ripped off or find yourself in real hot water. Uh, next slide. Um, mortgages and loans. Well, that's sort of the same thing, actually. But um, uh, uh, just, you know, just to, uh, uh, some people aren't familiar with this stuff. It seems intimidating, but um, mortgage payments, um, just to, to go over some basic stuff, some of you may or may not know this. Um, mortgage uh, payments, the monthly payments um, to a bank often include more than just the principal and interest on the loan. And just to sort of reiterate, uh, the principal is the money you're paying on a monthly basis to pay down the loan. 
um, th that helps you as time goes on to make a to have a smaller debt that you owe to the bank. The interest that you're paying is the bank's fee essentially for giving you that loan. So those are the two main components of every loan. Um, but they also, there's some loans uh, include payment for real estate taxes and insurance. Um, and, and that depends on the bank and the situation. But sometimes they like to know that the money is, is there for, for the real estate taxes or the insurance and that it's being properly paid. Um, if you're taking a, a loan that is more than 80% of the value of the property, uh, you'll probably have to also pay mortgage insurance or PMI. So that's another uh, term that you, might, you're gonna, you may encounter. Um, next slide, please. How do you choose the right, the, the right mortgage? Um, you know, one thing you should remember is that uh, mo the average, I read the average uh, home is owned for 13 years across the United States. Um, but that of course takes into account all sorts of things like demographics and location. Um, but if you're young, um, you may only be looking at a five-year timeline, or if you're buying this to renovate and sell it very soon, even shorter time period. I say all that because that's going to guide you as to what kind of loan you're going to be considering when you, when you look at the choices. Um, there are basically two types of loan products, as bankers like to call, uh, call them. Um, one is a fixed rate uh, loan, and the other would be an adjustable rate loan. Um, fixed rate are the 30 and 15 year fixed loans, they are generally a little bit more expensive because bankers don't like to tie their hands without um, getting, uh, you know, compensated for that. Um, and, you know, uh, in this low rate, uh, low interest rate environment, that is a very good thing to consider. But again, it depends on how long you think, you're, you know, what is your timeline? Um, adjustable rate mortgages generally are um, lower priced product. Um, uh, but the problem with them, them is that the rate can change over a period of time, depending on how the loan is structured. Um, and so that, that uh, percentage or that, that uh, monthly payment may go up or down, depending on, on the changing interest rate environment. Um, frankly, right now, interest rates probably only can go up. So um, arms are not as, as attractive if, if, in some ways. Um, to, but, they're, but they're definitely worth considering. And, and every day and every bank has some new way of, of twisting the, this information. So you're gonna have to shop around and really think about that. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but one more point, just the most common um, arm or adjustable rate mortgage or, uh, that you'll see is a 5-1 arm. And just so you know, that, that means that the interest rate stays the same for the first five years, and then it changes every following year. So in that case, if you think you're gonna be in that property for less than five years, it's probably something you should think about. Um, the next slide uh, is all about lenders. Um, what you wanna do when you go shopping around for a lender is to make sure that the lenders that you are evaluating are, are, are institutions or lenders who have done this, made loans for this kind of property that you're thinking about, uh, both in the location and considering what you might be doing to it. In other words, if you're renovating it. Um, I always look at, for at least three lenders. Um, even if you've got a lot of experience doing this, I find you, you learn a lot from different uh, lenders and talking to them. Um, and again, as I said, they all have various twists on these, these loans. And so you, you may want to really um, quiz them about what it is that they're, what they're offering. Um, and the way to find the good lender, I think is always, and this is true for sort of any professional, but um, check out, you know, what experts, that is brokers or lawyers that you might know, or friends who have done similar projects, um, see who they've talked to and what kind of experience they have with these lenders. Um, one a couple of little points, I mean, you may find that, for instance, credit unions are a good source for first-time home buyers, um, or uh, they may have, but that, that's sort of their specialty. Um, if you, uh, you should know that the Federal Housing Administration uh, has some good programs for First time home buyers who may have credit issues, um, which so they sort of require smaller down payments, which is good. Uh, the, if you're a veteran, the Veterans Administration has some, some good programs. Um, what I would most absolutely uh, recommend is to start this process now um, before you even start looking. Um, get, a, get, a, get a good idea of what it is that, that the lender or a lender or many lenders would be willing to loan to you. Um, just talk it over, lay the groundwork. And at some point, you can probably get what they call a pre-qualification letter uh, before you, you go out and start looking for properties. 
And that will come in handy, not only to give you comfort that you are doing the right thing, you're looking in the right price range and you know, the right kind of property, but also um, when you're negotiating with buyers, you may find that you can waive that pre-qualification letter and say, look, you know, you don't have to worry about me getting a loan. Um, I'm, I've, got, I've got this already in place. And that will give the, the sellers um, comfort that, that you are a qualified person. Um, next slide. Here's the fun part, uh, the search. Um, going out there and looking at properties. I, I, you know, if you don't like doing that part, then you probably shouldn't even be doing this in the first place. Um, it's, 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 you know, who doesn't like going into other people's homes and snooping? I mean, you know, that's, that's cool, right? Um, there are a lot of uh, options these days to find property and, and see what's out there. Um, obviously, the internet is, is, is sort of over, almost overwhelming in terms of different options to find and see what's on the market. Um, I, there are great tools out there. Uh, you should set up searches on these websites. Um, they give you alerts. I personally am a little old fashioned, but I love realtor.com. Um, uh, just as an aside, Zillow loves to give price estimates as estimates, and um, oftentimes they're wrong. So you have to really start thinking about value yourself. And that's how you're gonna learn what a property is worth is going out and looking. And you can't do it in front of a computer. You've gotta get, you know, put your sneakers on and get out there and, and pound the pavement. Um, you have, it's, you know, some people like to do the, the search themselves. They want to look at things and then make phone calls to the brokers who have the listings and go see them, things. That's fine. But if you're, I, I personally am not crazy about that idea, especially for people who are new to the process because you're losing the, um, the, the good advice of real estate agents. And I, I, I must say, you know, agents are an incredible source of, of information. Um, they are, uh, they, they have a lot of, 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 knowledge about the market, about what's out there. They will know about things before they come on the market and they will help guide you through the negotiation and the, um, the, the, the process with the contract going to the closing. So a new person, especially should really make sure that they, they find a good agent. So how do you do that? Um, again, word of mouth is really great. Um, you know, talk to your friends, talk to other people who have used, gone through this process and can offer a, an agent that, or, or several agents. And, and again, talk to a number before you really sort of commit to one. Um, this is controversial. I will say this. I hate using friends or relatives as, a, as, a, as real estate agents. I know there are probably some of them watching out here and they're going, oh no, don't, don't say that. And you know, I've worked as an agent. I, I, I started off as a, a, a commercial agent and then worked as a, a residential agent. And I can tell you, um, it's, it, it's one way that I got business, but it was a way that I wasn't personally very happy with. And then putting my other hat on as a buyer, um, it, it, I, I like to be able to be in a position where I can fire somebody. I mean, you know, if I've got my mother-in-law as my real estate agent, um, it's going to be really hard to say, you know, you're doing a horrible job and could we, we should, you know, part ways. So um, it just a word to the wise. Uh, the 80, 20 rule is, um, is something that in the real estate business, in the brokerage business, um, we talk about 20% of the agents do about 80% of the business. Um, and so, and you know, the question is, all right, so why? And that is because 20, those 20% are really good at what they do. And the other 80% are probably mediocre at best and maybe really bad at worst. So you need to find somebody who's in that 20% level and, and work with them. Um, it takes a little bit of trial and error. Again, you got to talk to your friends and, and see who's out there. Um, and if you, if you find you're working with somebody, you're not happy with that person, then go right ahead and, you know, move on. Um, just uh, be clear with that person. But I do think um, working with an agent and being loyal to the agent is a good thing because I'm um, having again been on both sides of it um, Agents uh, have a really tough job. I mean, it, it sounds wonderful. They go running off and they show Apartments or houses and, and then in, in a, without doing much work. They make a lot of money. Well, that's not true They put in hours and hours and hours of work I don't know any good agent who is not just you know burning the candle at both ends um, and so their time is very valuable and if you are loyal to that agent, um, they will know it and they will return the loyalty. But don't, don't work with three or four agents or try and you know, play games with people. You know, be, be, a, be a good person. This is a business and you know, your word is really important in, in, in business and in the world. Um, so you know, remember that. Um, 
The, uh, the other point I think that's really important is that as soon as you're looking at things that look good or might be of interest, get your contractor uh, involved with the process because you're going to learn a lot about that property from somebody that you're happy with. And we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit about how to get involved with contractors and how to choose them and so on in a minute. Um, then uh, the next slide, please. The next, the next big issue is when you're ready to make an offer, you're going to have to think about the contract because um, offers are, are transmitted by a, a, a contract, a draft of a contract. Um, so you're going to have to start thinking about some of the parts of the contract that are going to become important for you to make this deal happen. Um, it's, I love negotiating. Um, not everybody loves that stuff. I, I, but if you look at it as a sort of a chess game or a, um, you know, some sort of a mind, uh, mind, mind game that you're playing with somebody, um, you know, it, try to make it fun. You know, you're trying to think who's, what the next move is going to be, that kind of thing. Um, but hopefully your agent's also going to be involved with this. I mean, definitely would be involved with it and uh, would have the same um, enthusiasm that I have uh, for the negotiating uh, process. Um, the negotiable items on a, on a contract generally are the price, the amount of a down payment or earnest money that will be uh, made. Um, that, that would show the, the, buy, uh, the seller that you're operating in good faith. Um, there'll be a, a possible financing contingency, something that you, if you're looking for financing, want and something that the seller who wants a deal done and not have to worry about things probably doesn't want. Um, but you're, you, should, you should fight for that if you're, if you're buying. Um, there will be a period for the inspection. Uh, there will be a, a, a provision for the, any items that might be included in the sale. So be clear about what it is that, that's included in the, in the sale, that chandelier or that, uh, uh, I don't know what else that might be, that, you know, that, that gold toilet or something like that, I don't know. Um, think about warranties that might, be, uh, that might be included and the closing date is, is really important. Um, then, uh, next slide, please. Um, once again, uh, you know, read every word. Um, this is a very complex document. It's long and, and involved, but I can tell you, uh, it's worth knowing what it says. Um, you have to think a little bit about who's going to own this property. Is it going to be you all by yourself or are you going to be buying this with your, or are you going to be uh, buying this with a partner? But think a little bit about that now so that you're clear because you don't want to have to start answering these questions at the last minute while you're trying to make a deal. Um, don't, uh, again, don't, don't take this contract lightly. This is a legal document and there is the last thing you want is to be involved with some sort of legal dispute down the road. So think it through and, and, and read it very carefully. There are outs in a contract um, uh, and those would be if the seller can't give clear title, they can't give you uh, the, the, the turnover the title in a way that is um, not going to cause problems down the road. That's a, um, something that, that is a fairly simple concept, but you know, one you have to focus on. Uh, if the property doesn't meet the inspection expectations that, that you put in, um, and if you can't reach an agreement as to what kind of repairs are, are needed uh, or, or the amount of money should be uh, removed from the purchase price um, for repairs, that could be a problem. Um, and then uh, if you have a financing contingency, if the house does not appraise for the purchase price um, or if your financing is not approved, that's, that, those are two good ways to get out of a contract. Um, next slide. Uh, home inspections are, are important and you should please do me a favor, do yourself a favor, get a real home inspector. Don't get some guy with a business card and a flashlight who's going to poke around and look at things. You know, that is, the, you want an expert who's going to give you a, an honest assessment of what's going on in the house or, and, and what you don't see. Um, you can get recommendations, again, from families and friends, your agent. Um, if you're doing a gut renovation, some people think, well, what do I need a, a home inspector for? You do. I mean, you're still paying for the roof. You're still paying for an electrical system. You're still um, thinking about termite damage. Um, so let, get, get a good inspector. Um, he will give you a detailed report. And uh, that'll be the basis for your, for your discussions with the seller about, um, about what needs to be done to, to maybe correct some of these problems. Final slide, um, don't forget um, before you, as soon as you make a deal on, uh, on the contract, get the lender involved ASAP. Um, check all the information uh, given to you by the lenders. Those can be long and tedious documents. Um, I, I put this in here, do not, or to remember to notify the utilities that you're now the owner. That's a little ahead of the game uh, because my closing words are, don't break up or open your bottle of champagne until after the closing. 
Um, anything can happen between the time you sign that contract and the time you actually take title. So don't take anything for granted. But once you close, go ahead and open that champagne. <laughs> so that's, that's enough for me. Uh, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you take it back, Danielle. Danielle, your mic. Thank you, there we go. Uh, thanks so much, Charlie, that was phenomenal. Tons of information. For those of you who are watching, um, you are able to send in questions for Charlie and for Randall as he gets started with his presentation. At the bottom of your screen, there are two buttons. One says chat, one says Q&A. Either one of those, you can type in your question and send it in. And at the end of this um, presentation, around 6.45 or so, um, we will do Q&A. So please send in your questions and, and get, get, get that ready um, so we can uh, get these questions to Charlie and Randall. Okay, Randall, it's your turn. Take it from here. Okay, okay. How's everybody doing this evening? Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Can anybody, somebody just raise their hand and make sure I'm okay? All right. Well, uh, Charlie's spoken on a, a number of things that are on the front end of acquiring a, a property or looking into doing a new project. So hopefully I can give you more of some insight as to when you cross that threshold of actually purchasing that property and getting into it and deciding, you know, how far you want to take your project and what you can expect during the construction process. And just to give you some general guidelines and give you some some key terms that will help you maneuver within a construction project. Uh, there are some, some different concepts and, and different key items that you're gonna encounter uh, that you wanna be leery of to help you make some smart decisions as you start to you know, decide on things that are gonna eventually cost. And uh, from there, you know, I've, I've kind of broken my information down into uh, four different categories. Uh, and for one, there are different role players and team members within a construction project. Uh, I'll break down what those different roles are and who those folks uh, might be and what you can expect from them. Uh, from there, there's also what's called a project delivery method. And the project delivery method is something that dictates uh, how the construction and how the design process will be delivered to you as the owner or the occupant, uh, hopefully, when that project is completed. Um, the next is uh, what to expect as far as the time associated with construction projects and construction agreements in general. And with the uh, time associated with construction projects, just to give you an idea of the level of commitment uh, that you may expect when you start to, to go into a construction project with someone, especially if you are hiring others for uh, professional services. In the last category that I have are just based on key terms that impact renovation. Some key terms that you're gonna hear and you may encounter that, that will definitely kind of uh, decide if, if your project is going in a good direction or you might have a hiccup. But in renovation, there will always be some hiccups and hopefully with some of these key terms and general ways of thinking, you'll be able to cross those hurdles and uh, come out on the good side of it. So uh, as far as role players, uh, there's your contractor. Your contractor is gonna be responsible for delivering the construction, which is included uh, the materials and labor uh, for, your, for your project. Uh, you have what's called a designer. A designer is something that's kind of optional based on the complexity of your project. Uh, you may have, to, you have interior designers. Uh, you have some folks um, who are full-blown architects. So you could have a designer or architect uh, that can also provide the same services, you know, for houses. Houses aren't that uh, too, too complicated. So, you know, if sometimes you have people that can offer the same services, but getting the licensed architect is always going to benefit you on the front end. It may seem like it costs a little bit more, but what you're going to get from a licensed architect is going to help you very much. Uh, and then there's a structural engineer. Uh, structural engineer will be more related to someone uh, who's providing design services to you uh, that may be a draftsman or maybe a designer. But if you hire a good architect, your structural engineer will be included within that architect services. So uh, it's very important to uh, kind of weed out who you decide to, to start to do business with on the front end 
to make sure that you're going to get full blown services that won't, uh, you know, have you needing more at the end or having to pay for more people to do more things. So uh, with those different role players, uh, another thing to think about is the project delivery method. And there are two very popular project delivery methods. The most traditional is, has been over the years, has been design, bid, build, where you would buy your house, you decide what you want to do with it, you hire your architect, and from there, you take the architect's plans and you shop out a contractor, which is the bidding process. And then from there, you decide on a contractor and you move into construction. A more revolutionary idea, but it's been around for a very long time, is called design build. And with design build, that's when you have an entity or a uh, service provider that combines the design services and the construction services. So you're dealing with one person. So in, in a sense, you have saved a great deal of construction time on your project as far as the overall length of your project. So with those two different uh, project delivery methods, it can eliminate the amount of people you have to hire to help deliver your project. So something to think about between those two de project delivery methods, as well as the roles involved in uh, different team players on your team. So another uh, topic is the time associated with construction projects and construction agreements in general. Uh, roughly three months or more to get going with an architect's redesign and permitting with the city of New Orleans, given the complexity and size of your project. So, but from the time that you actually purchase that project, by the time you do a redesign with your architect um, and you go through a permitting process, you're looking at a minimum of three months uh, or longer, given the complexity and the level of things that you want to do with your property. I mean, people have all types of dreams. We watch HDTV. Uh, you know, and we want to do all these wonderful things, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, the, the rubber is going to meet the road with budget and, uh, and we have to make some moves. So the physical construction of a project can take anywhere from three to six months or longer, given the complexity and the scope of work needed. Uh, you could buy a smaller house, you could buy a larger house. Um, some of them could be in wor far worse shape than others. So. Uh, just in a general sense, you're looking at somewhere between three to six months or longer uh, to do your remodel or full-scale renovation. Uh, something to look for uh, from your, your contractor once you start to move into the construction phase. Uh, pricing and estimates from your contractor should always be broken down by line item. Any estimates or agreements that describe everything in paragraph form with a total price at the end and leave many things open to discrepancies or something that you, you don't want to get into. Uh, selecting a good contractor up front by maybe talking to two to three people is always going to benefit you. You can compare apples to apples. Hopefully someone comes well recommended. Uh, it's, never, it's never a problem to ask your contractor for proof of insurance. It's never a problem to ask your contractor for proof of license, references, uh, whatever you think would make you sleep comfortable at night and it's always good to talk to more than one. Uh, within the duration of construction, you should expect some form of communication with your contractor or project manager bi-weekly and a monthly walkthrough or a walkthrough at progress payment interval divide, defined, defined within your agreement. So uh, you should, you know, Starting a project and then checking on it every other day or weekly might be a bit much. Uh, it, it crosses the line with, you know, micromanagement and it can lead to some confusion based on you not doing that type of work every day. So uh, bi-weekly talking to someone is very good. And then on a monthly basis or when it's time to make payments with your contractor, you want to check in and do a walkthrough and make sure everything is to your liking, what you agreed upon. And you just don't want to, you know, be, be over uh, cumbersome in, in, in how involved you are. So you want to step back a little bit and give them some space to work. Uh, your payments towards contractors will typically be broken into three to five progress payments based on the complexity of your project. Uh, you could have a, a payment to start 
And from there, it'll be increments uh, based on the level of progress and the level of progress uh, in those payments. That's the purpose of your walkthrough to make sure that those things are being done and that uh, you're not paying too much uh, before that work is done. And you look up one day and you, you can't figure out why your project isn't finished. Well, that's because you know someone's been overpaid and uh, they, they, they may have bit off more than they can chew. So uh, some key terms that impact renovations and some key terms that you'll often encounter. Uh, one in renovation process is quote unquote, unforeseen conditions. And unforeseen conditions are a term that describes things that you can't see uh, when you initially walk through a house or you get your initial inspection report. Uh, this is something that you're gonna encounter when you uh, start to do demolition, you remove drywall or you decide you wanna move a wall over here and you wanna open up this room. Well, unforeseen conditions relates to uh, whatever you can't see and whatever needs to be repaired once you open those walls, whether it be termite damage, whether it be some form of mechanical ductwork or plumbing that can't be moved, which your uh, designer may have not been able to account for. Uh, so the importance of selecting a good uh, you know, architect up front and uh, making sure you get your good contractor involved up front, uh, those, those will always help you in the long run. So uh, one of the biggest components that affect renovations are called unforeseen conditions. These are conditions that are encountered during the renovation process that cannot be seen during initial walkthroughs and inspection related to new work. It is usually related to structural damage or structural alterations needed based on your new design and are often encountered during the demolition phase. Just wanted to reiterate that. Uh, unforeseen conditions often lead to another component that affects projects in both budget and overall time called a change order. A change order is a change to the original contract or agreement that alters cost and time associated with the changes needed. Change orders can also be based on wanting or selecting items outside of your contractor's allotted budget for fixtures, trims, and finishes. This leads to the value of involving an architect, designer, or design build contractor on the front end of your project. These role players are helpful in selecting the items you want, including the project on the front end, and allow for pricing to reflect those items so you are not subject to changes in cost. So what that really speaks back to is the, the benefit of selecting a good architect or going the design build method to where you can get your contractor involved in your pricing on the front design end and carry out those things that you wanted initially all the way throughout the project without the price changing on you uh, without you really expecting. So as a, what I have here? Uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, you should always expect to encounter termite and water damage in full-scale renovations is just something that you're always going to encounter, uh, especially with older homes. If a budget for damages like this cannot be assessed early on, uh, your agreement and generally all agreements relative to renovation should include a contingency budget, somewhere between 5 to 10 percent given the condition of the property. A contingency budget will help to cover costs relative to unforeseen conditions and minimal change orders. So hopefully uh, using, you know, thinking about those key terms as you, you know, have your bright ideas at night and, and wanna, you know, put on your uh, design hat and win your award, uh, hopefully thinking about some of those things will help you uh, make decisions that, that will be help you, helpful uh, towards you during your project and hopefully get a, a completion that, that helps you sleep well at night. And that's about all I have. Um, I think it's very important for us to do some Q&A for uh, more of a beginner, you know, type uh, session we're having here. And, and I, if I say this once, I'll say it, you know, however many times. 
I've learned that all of these projects are different. All of these projects are different. Um, even if you had the same house next to each other, the owner's gonna wanna do something different to it. So um, you'll, you'll always be doing something that's different. Thank now, you so much, Randall. That was fantastic. Um, okay, people, send in questions. We only have a handful and I know you have questions. So come on, send them my way. Uh, before I get to the questions, I just wanna give a shout out real quick. Well, first I wanna say thank you, Charlie and Randall. That was fantastic. So much information. And I know people are digesting and, and send, here we go, here's some questions, great. Um, but I do want to let you all know that if you are interested, if the renovation um, or property purchase that you're thinking of is, a is going to be used for commercial purposes and you are interested in using historic tax credits to do your project, we are actually going to be having a class just on historic tax credits in late September. It's either going to be the 28th or the 29th of the month, um, led by Jason Briggs of Historic Pro NOLA. So mark your calendars, keep, you know, keep up with us on social media to find out when we set the exact date. But just so you all know, right now in the state of Louisiana, we only have a historic tax credit program for, for renovations that will be a, a commercial property. So we do not, we used to have a residential um, historic tax credit program, we no longer have that. But this can apply if you are looking for a home to buy to use as a rental property. And from what I understand, it can even apply to part of your residence residence if you actually rent half of it out, so or part of it out. So if you live in a double and you want to renovate your home and use half of it um, as a rental property, then you can access some historic tax credits for um, that project from what I understand. Now, where the home is located or where your this property that you're gonna use for commercial purposes is located is vitally important. If you wanna access the state historic tax credit, which refunds 20% of all qualifying renovation costs, you must live in a cultural a state cultural district. And how do you find that out? Well, you go to the state's historic, um, the, it's the SHPO, the state office, the State Historic Preservation Office. That's SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office. So go to the Google and search Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office. It'll pop right up, Division of Historic Preservation. They have all the maps you can need. So for the state credit, again, a cultural district, and a lot of the city of New Orleans is in a cultural district, but not all. Um, if you want federal historic tax credits as well, it has to be in a national register district. Now that's also 20% of qualifying costs that can come back to you um, as a tax credit. Stack those two together, that's 40% of your qualifying renovating costs coming back to you for your historically appropriate renovation of a property. That's a huge deal. Um, but again, it has to be in the right district. You also want to go to the city of New Orleans website and find out if you're looking for a property. If that property is located in a local HDLC or Historic District Landmarks Commission District, because if it is and you have big plans for how the outside of this property is going to look, you might not be able to do all the things you want to do because these districts are governed by the city's historic um, district guidelines. And so you need to find out um, if you're, the properties you're looking at are within these districts as well. So I just wanted to kind of add that to the great presentations that we've already had. And now I am going to um, kick some questions over to you guys. Um, so the first is, do you ever pay a contractor upfront? Well, um, I would say it depends on the, the agreement. Um, it depends on where the funds are being dispersed from. Uh, you know, if, if you're a person that's renovating your home and you're going to do things out of pocket, uh, you know, what, what's the guarantee that if, if I come to work for you for a month and I put, you know, twenty to $30,000 into your project, that you're going to turn around and pay me? Uh, that's, that's a contractor's way of thinking. Um, or, you know, what if, you know, we were doing a project to where, uh, you know, the, the first payment or the first increment was a value of seventy five or $100,000. You know, what, what's the guarantee that once I put that money out there to do it, that I'll get reimbursed? So that's why a contractor is always going to be looking for a form of payment up front uh, just to get them started. And also, it's going to help ensure that 
you actually have the funds to pay for the project. Um, and, and there are different checks and balances on that as well. But uh, from a contractor standpoint, uh, they want to make sure that they can, you know, get their money back and hopefully uh, make some money uh, to be able to pay themselves at the end. Thank you. Um, kind of a follow up to contractors and pricing. Um, our viewer James wants to know with with bids, you know, how, if you're using design build, how do you know if the prices are fair if you're not a contractor yourself? Um, you know, it's hard to know what the going rate is for this work. Well, if I would say that if you are on the design build side of things and you want to go that direction, then you can still talk to two or three different design build contractors. And from there, you should uh, ask some questions about, uh, you know, if you already have the property purchased or you're looking at this particular property, within talking to those two or three different folks, uh, you will be able to weed out uh, what makes sense and what uh, it will be helpful for you or what sounds good. Yeah, I, I, I also want to add just that, you know, when you're hiring somebody, a contractor, um, you're, you're taking a little bit of a, a, a leap of faith because you probably haven't worked with this person before. So that's why it's really important to investigate who they are and what kind of work they've done and really, you know, know your stuff before you get in, in bed with this person. I'll be, pardon the expression. Uh, but, you know, it is, uh, it's, it's a serious commitment for everybody. And um, you've got to be really careful about this and comfortable. So take your time. In terms of the project delivery method, so how, how you'd go about this, is there one in particular that you might recommend for true beginners, first time renovation? Well, I guess I'll take that one. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I would say uh, I'm a big fan of design build because for one, I am just a, you know, my background is in architecture. I'm very design oriented. Uh, you know, I grew up with a hammer in my hand. So I like, you know, I'm, I'm both worlds. Uh, so that I'll always lean towards design build. But if I could help you understand anything, there is a large, there's a, a, a gray area or there is a big gap in between an architect's drawings, uh, those drawings that you might look at and say, you know, wall here, wall there, and how a contractor may interpret that. So if you are to, to get those services from the same entity, then it will allow that contractor to convey exactly, you know, what the design was all about because they're, they're coming from the same place. You know, if, if the design comes from, you know, another company, you know, I could take that and say, hey, this is what I expected it to be. And this is, this is what it says but it's just not how you envisioned it and it's not how you talk to your architect about it, so. The other side of that, I guess, is that uh, having an architect on your side is sort of a check against a contractor who may not know or may not, you know, be doing things the way you would expect. Um, but, you know, it's a team too. It's gotta be a team effort. And I've seen great combinations of contractors and architects and horrible combinations. And, you know, a lot depends on who you hire, once again. Um, so it, uh, it, it, I've, and I've also done both, both scenarios. So, and I, I, you know, I, my last project, which was my house here in New Orleans, I had an architect who did a great job with the plans. He actually recommended uh, the contractor I chose. I had a couple of others and, um, they had a long track record of working together. So, um, it was a breeze. It was one of the best renovations I've ever done. So, you know, I picked really good people. I've been doing it a long time. So it turned out that I knew what I was doing too. It takes time and it takes some, uh, some, it's the school of hard knocks. There's no doubt about it. One thing we hear a lot at the PRC, both from homeowners and from people at the city level um, who are issuing citations for violations in historic districts is that um, it's not uncommon for contractors who have no experience working with historic houses or understanding of, of historic materials and what should be used and should not be used with historic materials, it's not uncommon for them to say, oh yeah, sure, I know how to work on this house. And actually they cause lots of trauma to building materials and create bigger problems than were there before. So back to Randall's point about, you know, please ask for references. It's very, it's good to ask for um, examples of past projects so that you can verify that um, 
you know, the contractor that you choose has actually done projects similar to the one you're about to embark and on. Go, and go look at their work, you know, go see what they've done, talk to the owners that have, have worked with them, that's really important. So we have a, some questions about the budgeting process for a renovation. Um, it's, it's a common um, joke that, you know, the budget that you actually approve for your renovation is just the starting point. It's actually going to be way more expensive than you ever dreamed. Um, I always say twice as long and twice as expensive. But oh, God. <laughs> well, <laughs> That'll scare you all, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> um, what do you all think? Is that generally true? Should you have a contingency of X percentage and just kind of plan that that money is going to go out the door? What do you think? Well, Randall, you start. I'll let you do that. <laughs> oh, no um, well, I would say, uh, you know, again, we want to make sure that we're bringing well-qualified people to the table. Um, if, if you're doing a, a, a loan uh, based on your project, the banks will kind of, you know, they'll kind of guide you and, and, and they should give you some information as to what you can expect as far as overage. Because, I mean, they, they do these loans all the time. They can, they're going to appraise your project. Um, and, and, and Charlie, if, if I'm, you know, from what I've always gathered as a contractor, if, if I'm not grasping this, Charlie, you can definitely, you know, expound on it. Um, you know, so they'll, they'll forewarn you that, hey, you know, you're borrowing this amount of money. But uh, being that you're probably going to run over, you're probably going to need to account for, you know, something like this. You know, you don't want to look at an agreement or a, a, a estimate uh, on the project and say, hey, this is how much we're going to spend. Because there's so many other expenses that you're going to encounter throughout the process. And, and renovation is pretty tough. I mean, new construction is something different or an addition. But uh, when you get down to renovation, it's very hard to see some things. So... Yeah, I mean, you know, it, realistically, I, I don't know. I, I, I look at the number and I always tack on, I put on 20%. That seems to be a sort of rule of thumb. Um, but, you know, it sure is nice to have a bigger cushion if you can. Thank you. Our viewer, Kristen, asks, are there lenders who will give loans for homes that have structural issues and need renovation, or do you have to pay cash for such properties? Well, when you initially buy a property, um, again, you're going to get a, an inspection. Um, and so the, the, the original, you know, this is pre, pre renovation. Um, and so the loan for the property itself will be based on, on the value of the home, which will be dictated by, and, and the condition will help dictate the value of the home. Um, and then of course, you're going to get an home inspection and that will also further help you um, in your negotiations with the final, uh, you may get a credit on, on any work that may need to be done. Um, so there shouldn't be, uh, so the loan, generally speaking, um, you know, there will be appraisal, by the way, of course. Um, and, and so the appraiser will take a look at that property and say, well, you know, you're paying $250,000, but this property is not worth more than 150. And, you know, that'll have a huge bearing on, on what kind of loan you'll get. If they say, well, it's not worth 250, it's only worth 150. Therefore, we're going to loan you only 80% of that 150. Um, you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and, and consider what you've, what you've gotten yourself into, um, which is why you want to put in that contract that there's a financing contingency or an appraisal contingency. Great. And depending on your situation, if you're a first time home buyer or a first time renovator, um, to Charlie's point before, going to different types of lenders um, can provide different types of products. So you might be able to get a renovation loan um, at, as part of the package or incentives at, for, as a first time home buyer. Um, so there's different things available to help finance whatever project you might be taking on. Shop around. Mm -hmm. Okay, if the contractor does not do the renovation in the contracted time frame, is getting an extension a routine matter or do you cancel and do a new agreement, what would your recommendation be? Well, uh, I would hope that it's within reason. I mean, you can, set, you can set a timeline for a project, but as long as your contractor is making progress, as long as you're satisfied with the work, I would say stick with them. Because you know, if, if you haven't uh, reached a point to where, hey, this guy hasn't been here in a week or two, um, you know, or you haven't been hearing back from him, 
and you're not seeing the progress that you know if, if you're if you're to a point where you're unhappy then that's fine but uh, if you're talking about doing something that you're gonna a house that you're gonna live in uh, I would assume that you know there's always work going and that you're satisfied with the work I think that's most important yeah, I agree. I think it's important to have a, a, an open line of communication with your contractor and make sure you go visit the property. You know, I, I, I went and visited the house I'm in right now while it was under construction every day um, just to see what's going on and talk to the contractor constantly. So there's no mis mystery about what's happening. You know, um, contractors are busy guys. Often if they're good, they've got a lot of projects going on. Um, but, you know, you want to just, you know, you want to be uh, on, on the, on, in the front of their line if you can. Um, so, you know, don't make a, you know, don't be a jerk, but on the other hand, um, you know, just make sure that you guys are, you and the, and the contractor are communicating and hopefully you won't have problems. Is it common ever to have um, a, a, a daily fine or a weekly fine so that, you know, to have in the contract, the project will be done by this date. If it's not, then you will pay X amount per day or per week. Is that common or is that, what, what is that? I've seen it and I've done it. Um, it. I've done it generally more for bigger projects, not for renovations of homes. Um, uh, you know, that's a concept that works especially well if you're building a, a big commercial property. But uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tough one, and it's a, it's not one obviously that contractors are happy about, right, Randall? Not at all. Not at all. It, it refers to a term called uh, liquidated damages, and it's more of a, a commercial concept and a very large scale project concept. But uh, when, when you start to do a deal that may be more on the investor side to where, hey, um, you know, we're renovating this uh, tri or fourplex, whatever it might be, is this slew of condos or something uh, that's, that's in, based on investment deals and all this money that's supposed to be generated. Uh, hey, you know, that contractor, they, they're, they're liable uh, for, for time spent. So you want to, uh, I would say it just, it just depends on the project. But if it's just your personal house or something like that, um, you know, you don't want to be finding guys for, hey, man, you're two weeks over. <laughs> well, and plus, it's, you know, it becomes a nightmare trying to collect that and enforce it. And, um, you know, the, 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 I mean, I'm, uh, very, very important is just do whatever you can to avoid, you know, thinking about calling your lawyer. I mean, that's just the worst possible thing anybody's, I, and believe me, I've been there too. Um, and it's, it's, it's no fun. Nobody wins. It costs too much money. It takes too much time. And so, you know, work with the person um, and, you know, make sure that, you know, you can figure out a, a, a better solution, negotiate, you should be a d diplomat. Do either of you have any experience buying homes at auction with no inspection or appraisal contingency? I'm thinking, for example, the city auction, the Nora auction, anything like that. I haven't done it, but I can tell you that, that, that that's where your experience looking at property um, will come in handy. You know, you've got to get out there and see what the value is. Um, if you're if you're buying something where you don't have that option to 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 get out of it, if you will, and you know, you better know what the value is before you get into it. It's like uh, you know, anything at auction is a is a risk. Um, but you can do your homework, and you can you know, and I know in those auctions you can go look at the property and you can see generally what's going on. So you know, bring your little team there. And, uh, and see, see if you feel like this is, you know, and, and, you know, again, like any auction or going to the casino, you should have an upper limit as to what you're willing to spend and don't go beyond that. Don't get caught up in the, in the uh, excitement of the moment. What about you, Randall? Have you ever taken a, a gamble on a house that like uh, that? To, to Charlie's last comment, I found myself in an auction one time. Uh, and next thing you know, the prices, I, I didn't even know what was going on, honestly. And uh, I was trying to get this little house. Uh, it wasn't that big. It was in the Holy Cross neighborhood. And, you know, I said, hey, it's a good neighborhood. It's a small house, but and it needs a lot of work. But I said, hey, let me try to stick in for this thing. And next thing you know, this auction kept going on. I said, man, let me get out of this thing. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you do get the opportunity to go and scout these properties. I would not recommend uh, going into an auction for a property that you have not physically seen or you have not physically brought an expert out to look at. And at the end of the day, uh, anything that you bid on uh, is going to have a price to it. You know, well, wherever, that pro wherever that house is, there's a market for that particular neighborhood. There's a market, uh, there's a cap, and there's a cap at what you want to spend. So. 
Okay, so the last question kind of plays off this theme of gambling, because really any property that you buy is going to be a gamble. You're going to start the demo process, you're going to find surprises, and you'll have to deal with those as they come. Um, for people who are, are doing their first renovation, they're buying a property either to live in or you know, to market as a commercial property, they're doing their first project and they're shopping with their realtor and they're looking at some homes or buildings that really need a lot of work. A realtor might say, oh yeah, it's fine. You know, you can do, you can do it, you can do it. Who should they bring in as, um, you know, someone who can tell them this is gonna need, you know, a lot of work or this, this is doable or this is gonna be a complete, you know, foundation repair. Would it be a, an, a contractor? Is it an engineer who, you know, for someone who's just looking, is there someone else they can bring in besides the realtor to really help advise how big of a project this might be? Well, I'll just, I mean, my experience is that, I mean, well, I've done a lot of it. So I've, I've got to the point where you can kind of spot things that don't look right. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's part of ex your experience as you build up uh, over the years. But um, if you feel, if you can start the process of finding contractors that you like, you can bring them in to be, you know, before you even make an offer um, or an architect would work as well um, to, to give you some, some insight as to what they think might need help or, or be a problem. Um, and generally speaking, my experience is that contractors and architects are always happy to, to, to do that as a way of sort of getting your business. Um, I'm not advocating using anybody, but it, it's certainly a, a great way to, to get insight as to what a project might, might entail. Randall, do you want to weigh in at all? I totally agree. Um, you know, I'm often called out on the front end to look at properties for folks. Um, I wouldn't say that there is a charge, but you know, donations are always accepted because uh, at the end of the day, if if you're in the market and you're you're ready to purchase something, you're like, hey, uh, you know, I look up, I've looked at four or five houses for you, man, and, and we haven't bought one. So you know, I've I've done all these site visits, but you know, it hasn't led to to anything. So, uh, you know, uh, build your relationship with your contractor, come to form some, some form of agreement or your architect and you can use, you know, either one uh, while you're in the shopping, shopping around phase and, uh, and, and come to some form of agreement and, and you guys look at it together and make a decision. Yeah, you know, an architect might be um, another, as we didn't really focus on, but, you know, architects may, if, if, you're, if you're worried about over, overstaying your welcome with, with a contractor, and I think that's a good point, um, you know, you could easily pay an, an architect for an hour or so to take a look at a property and they could give you some, some pointers on that. So another option. Great idea. Thank you. We are out of time. I know that we didn't get to all of our questions. So for those of you who had questions that were either too technical or we just didn't have time to answer, I'm taking down your information so that um, I can get back to you with hopefully some more information. And this is the first of several classes over the next few weeks through September and October that are all going to be geared towards buying and renovating a historic property. So like I said before, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, sign up for our e-blasts every week, and you will be informed as to when the next presentation is. I want to thank Charlie and Randall so Can I say one more thing? Oh, yes, please. Give to the PRC. <laughs> <laughs> the PRC is one of the most important organizations in New Orleans. It is an incredible uh, group of people who are involved, um, does great, great things advocating for historic preservation, and um, always, always, always needs your contributions. So um, go to PRC, what is it, PRC, what's our N -O website? NO.org. PRCNO.org, mm -hmm. okay. And, and look for the donation button because that is something you should do. Done. Yay, Charlie, board member of the year. <laughs> thank you so much. That's so kind. Well, thank you both so much. Randall and Charlie did an amazing job. We've got great praise in the comments for your excellent presentation. We really appreciate your time and expertise tonight. So thank you both so much. And thank you for all you do for PRC as board members. We're so grateful to have you on our leadership team. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in tonight. We hope you enjoyed this program. We hope you'll join us for future programs in the coming weeks. And I hope you have a great night. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.